Hallelujah. Glory to God. my mama is sitting up in the, the emergency room tonight in the ICU with COVID-19. And she went into cardiac arrest on last night, but she's still here in the land of the li living on tonight. So I got a reason to worship God on tonight. I got a reason to give honor to God on tonight. So yeah, I don't need no music because I got to worship deep down in my spirit on tonight. Oh, come, let us sing joy unto the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us sing praises unto our God. Let us sing aloud to the God that sit high and look low. Let us praise the God who is the healer. Let us exalt his name on today. For he is a good God. And he's worthy of all the praise and all the honor. What a mighty God we serve on today. For he is the King of kings, and he is the Lord of lords. Let us come before him with a great thanksgiving. Let us pray. God of our weary years, and God of our silent tears, God who has brought us safe this far, the God who has not brought us this far to leave us, but who's going to take us all away. God, we trust and believe in you. God, that you would just come into this place on this morning. Lead us and guide us like you've never guided us before. God, and we ask on this morning, God, the same spirit that is in this place this morning, God, that you ought to allow your manifest spirit, God, to go out on the airways, God. In the name of Jesus, that by the sound of my voice, that you will touch everybody on Facebook and YouTube, God. That's looking for you to show up like you've never shown up before, God. Bless them in the name of Jesus. God, we're expecting you, God, right now in the name of Jesus. God, we're expecting you to restore, replenish, and, and replace, God. And God, we're respecting healing in the name of Jesus. God, we believe in you, God. We got a new president, God, but our faith is in you. We are about to have a new administration, God, but our hope is in you. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we do pray. Amen. Come and let us sing, come and let us sing, come and let 
how we celebrate on today, how we give God glory because we know that the Lord is worthy to be praised. We celebrate the Lord in spirit and in truth. In this place, we've come to understand and recognize that God is magnificent. God has continued to provide, look past all of our faults and meet every one of our needs. And so we worship the Lord on today. We give God glory on today and thank God for all that the Lord has done. If you're ready for it, here it is. This is the day that the Lord has made and we have come to rejoice and be glad in it. We celebrate with you on this morning and we are so delighted that you are just worshiping with us on today as we come and celebrate uh, on this Sunday uh, in January 2021. We're getting ourselves together, getting our hearts right, getting our minds together as we usher in possibilities and usher in uh, new hopes and dreams and ideas as we whisk and away poor thoughts, poor thinking, and, and quite honestly, poor people who are not qualified or capable to exalt the name of the Lord. But we recognize God gives us new uh, majesty and new opportunities each and every day. And so we celebrate what the Lord is up to and what the Lord is doing. So we welcome you to our worship in this place of celebration. We are grateful for you sharing all friends and family of the New Calvary Baptist Church who share with us uh, on this morning. We're grateful for all of you all across uh, this country and all across the World Wide Web and other places where you uh, view and where you worship on this Sunday. We take it not for granted that you are sharing with us and we hope and pray something is said or done that inspires you and empowers you to continue to run on just a little while longer. We do indeed believe that this is a wonderful place filled with wonderful people because we serve a wonderful, wonderful God. If you are indeed uh, considering a church home, we want you to consider New Calvary because this is the place that we'd love to have you and celebrate with you as we grow together uh, in understanding the majesty of the Lord. Just want you to put your likes up, your hands up uh, for you appreciating this musical aggregation that just continues to bless us continually. So won't you just thank God for them. We are grateful. Amen. For Minister Yvette Brown Moore for ushering in the spirit today, ushering us in to worship. We're grateful for her. Uh, and all of the associates of New Calvary Baptist Church, how thankful we are for their gifts and their abilities. Want to just share some things tonight. Got some announcements for you. Uh, just want you to be aware and made aware of there. We want to continue to make you uh, alert to the mammogram screening that is taking place. Uh, it's a Terra Cancer Network is offering free mammogram screenings for those who meet the criteria. The uninsured, the underinsured, Virginia residents, women 40 years and older, and men are also eligible if you have high risk of breast cancer. Contact the church for further information and for further details, and we will give you what you need and route you to the right places. We also continue to encourage all of those members of New Calvary as we seek to do church differently in 2021 and the staff is looking to create different ways in which we innovate our connections and to innovate these ministries that if you are indeed involved or leadership in leadership of a ministry of New Calvary, uh, please get in contact with the church so we might set up virtual meetings for you all to do what it is you need to do for this year. So make sure that you contact the church office uh, so we can get your ministry up and running virtually. Food Pantry. Uh, the New Calvary Community Development Corporation continues to go underway. This is for Calvary Tower. Uh, the CDC has created the list of needs uh, for the food pantry that serves the residents of Calvary Tower. So it also includes the toiletries and the personal hygiene needs as well. So please contract, uh, contact uh, the church office or get an electronic copy of the list of items so that you can help and give to that so that we can continue to be a blessing to the residents of Calvary Tower. We uh, continue to work diligently and faithfully uh, with Reverend Mack as we look to do our food pantry and our food giving here at the church, but we are working out the logistics in that, so we want you to just be patient with us uh, as we continue to be faithful in that. You all know 
uh, that New Calvary Baptist Church is the greatest church to worship this side of heaven. You know that we are blessed with a wonderful uh, set of faithful individuals from the pulpit to the door who continue to work that the Bible talks about. Paul talks about uh, the church being the body, of being the body of Christ and how the body of Christ blesses us. And you know that we have one of the best executive pastors in this side of heaven in the form of the Reverend Byron L. Harris. And so we are grateful for him and all of his gift and everything that he does. And we are going to celebrate him, beloved, January 31st. That is the fifth Sunday of this month of January. We're going to celebrate and honor him and bless him as we can as our executive pastor. The uh, speaker uh, will be the Reverend Hugo Morrison. He is the lead pastor of the Un Unity United Church of Christ right there on Gulf Street. He is our neighbor. He is a dear beloved friend of uh, Pastor B and so he is going to deliver the word in celebration of his anniversary and his honoring. So make sure that you prepare yourselves. Make sure that you prepare your hearts, your minds, and your spirits to be a blessing to this awesome man of God and this awesome fellow who continues to bless us and help us along the way. Please continue to put your likes up and your hearts up for our very own executive pastor, your favorite executive pastor, Pastor B, as we continue to celebrate his ministry. We also want to lift up that uh, the Sunday school classes will begin. We are grateful to have our teachers in place, our teachers trained, and our teachers prepared, not just for the word. They're already prepared for the word and to teach the word of God, but we are have them prepared uh, for the phone line and to work that phone line. And so please make sure that you would call and get uh, call the church office to get the information. There are three different phone lines uh, for each different class. Uh, Dr. Margaret Bell will be teaching, Deacon Linda Cole along with uh, Sister Dr. Mildred Reed along with Reverend Calvin Brown. They will have three different classes and so make sure that you call uh, to set up for those classes. They will all begin at 9 a.m. on Sunday morning so please make sure that you sign up to be a part of those classes on the phone line and I am excited about what God is doing through the gift of ministry as we continue to go forward in our Christian education. Also, we are thankful for all of you who continue to be faithful in your giving. Please make sure that you are faithful in the giving that God has blessed you with, and we cannot continue this work and this ministry, even in this virtual season, even in this season of social distancing, without you. And so please remember to give your tithes and your offerings to New Calvary Baptist Church. You can drop them off or you can mail them to at 800 East Virginia Beach Boulevard here in the city of Norfolk 23504 uh, or you can go on GiveLify and make New Calvary your favorite place to give as you give faithfully uh, to the ministry and to the work that we are looking to do here at the New Calvary Baptist Church. Our office hours are 9 a.m. through 2 p.m. Uh, Tuesday through Friday, Tuesday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. for our COVID-19 hours. So please be faithful in that. I am excited uh, to just share some information with you. Uh, you all know <clears throat> around this time of year, around what goes on and around what happens, we begin to talk about everything that goes on in terms of Ma'afa. And you know that Ma'afa is a big project around here, and Ma'afa is... Uh, a wonderful uh, example and a wonderful demonstration of how we honor and remember our ancestors and our history and our journey here in uh, from Africa to America. And I have been blessed and grateful for all of those who have participated in the Ma'afa uh, for the years that we have done it. And this year, the two, 2021, we continue to share in the Ma'afa project in a unique and different way. We have been blessed, New Calvary, uh, by the progenitor, by the originator of the church's presentations of Ma'afa, the Reverend Dr. Johnny Ray Youngblood, who uh, or, uh, originated putting these Ma'afas together for churches uh, over almost 30 years ago. 
has blessed us uh, and called us to invite us to participate uh, in Ma'afa 2021 this year, um, and we're going to do it all virtually. And so what they've asked us to do is to share in some clips uh, for uh, our past Ma'afas, but they're also asking us to do One Piece Live. And those of you who remember and who have watched and shared with us, experienced Ma'afa with us, uh, know that we do a spoken word piece called Who Cares? And so we are asking for about 12 to 15 people, 12 to 15 people to reach out uh, to the church. You can reach out. You can call me. You can reach out and make connection. You can sign up uh, even in the comment section right now. Uh, here's the thing. We need about 12 to 15 persons to participate. You will be on Zoom. You will be in your home on Zoom, so you won't have to go anywhere. You'll be in on Zoom in your home to participate. There are lines, but because it's on Zoom, you do not have to memorize them. You only have to know them well. You only have to know how to recite them well and present them well. And so we will go over that and we'll give you the rest of the details. This event, our event, we've been asked to present on February the 7th, that's the first uh, Sunday of February at 5 p.m. So our uh, my offer presentation will take place uh, February 7th at 5 p.m. So please make sure I'm looking for some persons. If you were a part of the final scene of my offer before, uh, you can uh, be a part of it again. Just let me know again. It's just reading some lines and sharing. Y'all know how the scene goes. If you're not familiar with how the scene goes, don't hesitate. We still would love you to participate. So we're looking for about 12 to 15 persons uh, to participate in that, uh, and we look forward to celebrating. And we thank you in advance uh, for what is going to take place. I believe it's going to be a wonderful experience. And it's going to be a blessing to the people of God. We're going to continue to move forward in our worship experience. Please like and subscribe to our pages on Facebook and to on YouTube uh, as we continue to do the work of ministry here at New Calvary Baptist Church and as we share that you would share it and inform somebody along the way. We're going to continue to move forward in our worship experience as we share in a word of prayer. We believe that there is power in prayer. We believe that God continues to move and share uh, as only God can in moments of distress and moments of encouragement. We continue in this place uh, to pray for those who are in grief, those who are in mourning. We continue to lift those individuals up. We pray uh, for uh, Sister Sarah Elam, who lost her son recently, and his homegoing celebration will be uh, this coming Thursday uh, at Fisher Funeral Home at 11 uh, a.m., and so we want you to pray uh, for Sister Elam and her family at this time. We continue to pray for Minister Yvette Brown Moore's mother, as we believe God is continuing to do wonderful things, even in this season of COVID, we believe that healing is possible. And so if there are other prayers or concerns that you share in this moment, please Please put them in the comment section. Please drop them and that we might be faithful uh, in praying and celebrating what God is doing, but also what God uh, can do in your situation and in your life. So as we prepare our hearts and minds and as we look to the Lord in prayer, let us share in a word of prayer together. God, how we love you and how we bless your holy name. How we thank you, God, for all that you do. How we bless you, God, for the day that you have blessed us with and given us even in this moment. So, God, what we ask as we continue to just move in this worship is that you would hear our cry, oh God. That you would hear us in this place. That you would uh, receive, God, this offering of thanksgiving. Because, God, we do want you to know how grateful we are. We're grateful, God, for this morning in which you have allowed us to be blessed. Grateful, God, for this day in which you have allowed us to see. Grateful, God, for the mercy that has followed us and continued to keep us all the days of our lives. Grateful, God, for the weight, dangers, toils, and snares that you've brought us from. Grateful, God, that even in the moments where we were unsure, God, you were continued to be confident. You continued to press forward. You continued to cover us and shower us and lead us in the direction you desired us to go. And so, God, even in this moment, whatever it is we might be facing, we believe that you're still God all by yourself. We believe that you're still making ways. We still believe that you're healing bodies. We still believe that you're making things recover. We still believe that you're restoring right now, God, in the name of Jesus. 
We're calling, God, that you would heal everybody that is experiencing sickness. We pray, God, that you will in this moment continue to just have your way and that your will might be done. We pray, God, for a nation that's going through and experiencing all kinds of stress and division. But, God, we know that as people of light, we know as people of faith that this is not the first time that we have had to experience uphill climbs and uphill battles. This is not the first time that we have had to experience opportunities position but despite what it is we're facing we still give you the honor we still give you the praise and we still push toward the upward way so God right now everyone under the sound of my voice I'm asking that you would touch them everyone God who needs to hear right now I ask that you would bless God everybody whose spirit is under distress I ask God that you would give them comfort Every person, God, who is seeking understanding, God, I ask them that you would take them out of the places of wilderness and bring them to places of light. For we believe, God, that you have not brought us this far to leave us. We believe, God, that you're still making ways out of no way. We believe, God, that your name still means power. It still means grace, and it still means possibility. So, God, as we continue to pray for one another, we pray for every household we pray uh, for every financial situation we pray God for everyone under the sound of my voice that, that whatever it is they need they might petition you God and that you would hear it and make ways in the name of Jesus for we love you God and we believe that all things are still possible we believe that you're still working it out we believe that you're still doing it and God we say thank you right now Thank you, God, not just for what you've done, and thank you, God, not for what you're doing, but God, we thank you in advance for the things that you will do. We give you praise, honor, and glory for the things um, that will be taken away. We give you praise, honor, and glory for the obstacles that will be knocked down. We, play, we give you praise, honor, and glory for the overcoming that will happen. And we do it, God, gratefully and in the name of Jesus. It's in the wonderful and marvelous name of your son, the one who paid it all, that the people of God together say amen, say amen and say amen. Come on, put your likes up, uh, put your hearts up as we receive uh, this musical aggregation that blesses us through song as we prepare to continue to worship. Someone asked the question. Someone asked the question. Why do we sing? Why do we sing when we lift our hands? When we lift our hands to Jesus. What do we really mean? What do we really mean? Someone may be wondering. Someone may be wondering when we sing our song. When we sing our song. At times we may be crying. At times we may be crying when nothing's even wrong. When nothing's even I sing, I sing because I'm happy, I sing because, I sing because I'm free, his eye, his eye is on the sparrow, that's the reason why I sing, glory, hallelujah, glory, hallelujah, you're the reason why I sing, glory, hallelujah, You're the reason, you're the reason why I sing. Someone, someone made me question, why do we sing? Why do we sing? When we live, when we lift our hands to Jesus, what do we really mean? What do we really mean? Someone may be wondering, someone may be wondering, when we sing our when song. We sing our Nothing's even wrong. When nothing's even wrong. I sing because I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eye is on. His eye is on the sparrow. That's the reason why I sing. Glory, hallelujah. Glory, hallelujah. You're the reason why. You're the reason why. You're the reason why. 
somebody asked you, and if somebody asked you, was it just a show? Was it just a show? Lift your hand. Lift your hand and and tell the whole world no. And tell the whole world no. And when we cross, and when we cross that river, to study war no more. and bless the God of our salvation. We bless your name and we thank you for this moment. Thank you for the time you've allowed us to come together. Thank you for worship. Thank you for your grace. Thank you, God, for touching us. Thank you, God, for speaking to us. Thank you, God, for lifting us up. Thank you, God, for pouring into us and feeding us. For we know that there's so many places, so many ways in which we can find ourselves turned around and unsure, afraid, anxious, insecure, worried, angry. For God, we leave it in your hands now. We leave it with you when we ask that you would just speak to us. We ask that you would fill us up. We ask that you would speak to our hearts. Because we make no mistake that we need you now. And so God, as you do, show up in those ways that just remind us that you're still God all by yourself. Bless this moment that, that I might decrease as thou increases and beautiful people might see less of me and more of thee. Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by the power of thy grace divine. My soul look up with a steadfast hope and let my will be lost in thine. It is in the wonderful, marvelous, majestic name of Jesus. The people of God who love God together say, Amen and Amen. Come on, thank God for this choir that blesses us as only it can. Indeed, it'd be a grateful for them being so faithful in so many different ways. We thank God for their gift. I call your attention to the book of 2 Timothy. 
book of 2 Timothy, chapter 4. Book of 2 Timothy, chapter 4. As it reads this way in the New International Version, 2 Timothy, chapter 4. Verses 3 through 5. Verses 3 through 5. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 through 5. It says, For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you keep your head in all situations, endure hardships, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. Verse 5 says, but you. Keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship and do the work of an evangelist and discharge all the duties of your ministry. I want to talk from this idea, beloved. Remember who you are. Remember who you are. My big brother in ministry and idol, Dr. Frederick Douglass Haynes, pastor of the Friendship West Baptist Church in Dallas, recalls a moment of good memory one time in the black blockbuster movie Black Panther when T'Challa is being celebrated as the Black Panther due to the death of his father. And as they go through the ceremony, all the other clans agree with no contest and objection the naming of T'Challa to be the next Black Panther. But then, out of the mountains, we hear the call and the cry of opposition. M'Baku, the leader of the white guerrilla cult, comes down and to say that he himself will fight for the crown because for far too long, one family has had control. T'Challa is stripped of his power uh, as he must take M'Baku head on and they engage in combat uh, and as they engage and engage in this moment, T'Challa slips and avoids M'Baku's forceful advances. But during the scuffle, T'Challa loses his weapon and is grabbed and held in a bear hug by the strong, imposing warrior M'Baku. He says, where is your help? He taunts him and says, where is your strength? And as he, uh, T'Challa is bloody and bent backwards, his mother, Ramonda, looks at him and hollers, show him who you are. T'Challa finds the strength within him and says, I am the prince T'Challa and the king, uh, the son of King T'Chaka, and proceeds to turn things around in the physical contest. By the time it's over, he has forced M'Baku to yield and recognize that he is defeated and he must now yield to the king, the one they call the Black Panther. And the truth is, my brothers and sisters, I promise you I'm almost finished the sermon right now. That the point is I'm trying to make simply is that in this, some, sometimes in this life you have to remember who you are. Sometimes you've got to call who you are and whose uh, you are in the midst of others around you who try to reduce you and make you less than what God has created. That sometimes you have to be honest with yourself for your own protection and come to grips with the fact that everybody is not out to help you. That everybody doesn't want you to succeed. That everyone is not in your corner and there are people who are not concerned with your growth and your advancement. Now, I know that that's not rainbows and butterflies. I know that that's not what some folk want to hear in this particular moment. I know that this might be unsettling in a Christian environment, but fortunately, that's the way and the world that we live in. You see, we can talk about being people of faith all we want, but we have to take a long, hard look at what being a person of faith really means. See, faithfulness doesn't mean giving up. Faithfulness does not mean let evil take over. Faithfulness does not mean be passive to the point of your own detriment or damage. Faithfulness may mean the truth needs to be told. 
Faithfulness may mean honesty needs to be shared, and sometimes faithfulness means that you have to take stands that need to be made. This past uh, week, this past week, last Wednesday, thousands of people, for a whole lot of reasons, felt the need to storm the halls of Congress and the Senate, and did so believing that they were correcting a wrong that needed to be made right. And one of the things that we can talk about is how many people are responsible. We'll get to that. We can talk about how many people need to get blamed or understand who needs to be blamed. But the fact of the matter is, is no matter what these people have tried to do, no matter what the attempt was, no matter what certain people want you to believe, we still have an assignment to remember who we are. We still have a responsibility to focus on the purpose of why we do what it is we do. And when others seek only to destroy or only to live according to their own purposes or their own reasons, we look to honor God in our faithfulness. The journey to God's will and God's purpose is never easy. And it's easy to find ourselves distracted and off-center if we start to listen and follow those who are concentrating on chaos. We are called to understand that our true purpose is, and we're called to walk in what God is showing us, and we're called to understand that despite what other folk might try to do, that we are called to remember who we are in God. Journey with me in this text and understand that when you remember who you are, that Paul says there will be some people who are going to get to a place where they will simply reject logical and simple reason. Paul is at this place of departure meaning that the time of ministry is soon coming to an end. Paul, who has been considered one of the greatest evangelists, one who has brought good news all over the region, is at a place where the circumstances of the time have caught up with him. Paul is looking uh, like this time on earth is over. But before he takes this journey into eternity, Paul makes the most of his earthly time and has invested in a young man named Timothy. Timothy is a young man with a faithful family, a young man uh, with a history, uh, with a family of loving the Lord and wanting the best for his church and God's people. Timothy's grandmother, Eunice and Lois and mother, they have been people uh, that Paul has known, and now he is mentoring this young man to continue the work that Paul and so many others have started. Many different instructions are given uh, to Timothy throughout these books, but in this fourth chapter, the scholars call this one his final charge to the young minister and servant and tells him to be consistent in all that he does regardless of the atmosphere. Though I know it didn't sound that way when you read it, but when you listen to it, it's there. Look at what he says. He says right there in the second verse of the chapter, preach the word. He says, and be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, encourage, and patience with careful instruction. Uh, Paul says to Timothy, whatever the atmosphere, tell the people what they need to hear. Sometimes it's going to require correction. Sometimes it's going to require rebuke. Sometimes it's going to require encouragement. But it will always require patience and planned and careful instruction. Paul says, whatever you have to give to the people, give it to them the way that they both need to hear it and the way that they're both able to hear it. Don't miss that. He says, give it to them the way they both need to hear it and the way they are able to hear it. No matter what the atmosphere is, no matter what the season is, in season or out of season, whether it's popular or whether it's not, if it's advantageous or when it's not easy to digest, when it's against the enemy and when I need to hear it, give it consistently and give it accurately. Part of the issue we're dealing with now is that we find ourselves in this place where people don't want to hear or listen to what they need to hear. Uh, We have acknowledged that we are in a particular season. A season that is different, but the truth is, it's been coming for a while. The church and its believers have to come to recognize that we need to work with careful instruction um, when we preach the word to the people and teach the people. We need to bring the people a message they can receive and they can hear. Y'all ain't feeling me? Okay, here it is. It goes this way. Paul says, so there in verse 3, a time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Uh, Y'all missed it. A time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Okay, can I help some of y'all? There is a time coming where people will not put up with the truth. 
Paul says sound doctrine. So it's not like he's saying that the word isn't good. It's not like he's saying what's shared is not beneficial. It's, it's not that the instruction doesn't stand the scrutiny of examination. It's that regardless of the fact that it's true, regardless of the fact that it's right, regardless of the fact that it's sound, regardless of the fact that it's good instruction, people will not put up with it, meaning they will choose not to embrace it. People will make the conscious decision not to embrace good teaching. People will make the constant uh, and, and constant uh, fact, and they will make the constant and conscious decision not to embrace right when it's right. And they will not want to be bothered when it's the truth. Can I make this thing live? So many people will hear that they counted ballots over and over and over and over again and they will still choose not to receive it. They will be told by people in their own political party that the election was protected and safe, safer than most elections prior to this one, and they will still choose not to receive it. They will be told by people who fact check after fact check in states that have been historically red states, but at this time their candidate did not get selected, and they will still choose not to receive it. Instead, they will choose to reject what's being shared. And here's the thing. They will look at the results and choose not to receive what's happened because they believe, that they, they believe the voting process, right? They believe that the voting process is corrupt. They believe that they choose not to believe it, uh, that the election uh, is sound because they will believe that the voting process is corrupt but never consider that the problem was the person they were voting for. They would be, be more willing to believe that the process is corrupt rather than believe that the problem is the person that they voted for. Uh, that never once did the people consider that the reason that the president lost was because of the kind of candidate and the kind of person he was. That because he was a narcissistic, deranged, misogynistic, disillusioned, psychotic demagogue who insulted people of color, who insulted the physically disabled, who insulted women, who insulted Hunter Biden's addiction, who insulted soldiers, who insulted war veterans, this, none of this was the reason that he did not get the majority of the votes, but that the voting system is broken. And here it is, watch this. I'm not defending the voting process. That's, in fact, I'm doing the opposite. I'm saying for years, you had African Americans counting jelly beans for the right to vote. You had them recite the preamble of the Constitution for them to vote. You had to walk miles in order to vote, only to refuse them the right. You changed voting districts, made excuses with certain ID cards. You shut down voting locations and sent people to the wrong places. You sent defective voting equipment. You stole an election from Stacey Abrams and the governor uh, uh, and Andrew Gillum in Florida, and all of that was okay, but now now, when your guy isn't elected, the whole system is broken. You're choosing not to put up with sound doctrine. And don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. That's not the main issue. It fits in the text, but that ain't even the main issue. The doctrine these folks are refusing ain't just for election results. What these folks are refusing is the doctrine of Jesus Christ. They are refusing to accept that Jesus was a Palestinian Jew raised in an oppressive society, dealing with a Roman Empire's policy and structure. A man who taught that the commitment to humanity is bigger than your personal gain. That the welfare of the other is essential to the fellowship of, the God, of God. A Jesus who taught that empires will fall and kings will change, but the love of God will remain forever. A savior that recognized that even though all of us don't come into the world with the same opportunities, we all come in the same into the world with the same amount of worth. A Jesus that has talked about injustice being violence, not to just one, but to all of God's creation. 
a Jesus who taught that it's not your own rituals that mean the most, but it's who you are on the inside that affects what you do. A teacher who said that there's more resources in a little bit of faith than a whole lot of power. A friend who told you that you won't always be with you, but he's preparing a place for you. A savior that was a threat to the status quo, who was turned on by his own people, and who was tried and crucified by the government in capital punishment, all because he understood that corruption and imperial power is not great than the power of an almighty God. But despite what was done to him was given power to surpass and understand that it's a power that still gives us help and leads us each and every day. That's what they were refusing. That's what people will reject. They reject because it means that you think of somebody else other than yourself. You reject Jesus because it means you actually have to be considerate to be a follower. They reject Jesus because it means I don't, I have to look past myself and actually see others around me. Paul says they won't put up with it. They won't want to hear it. It will be useless to them because it will require too much work. They have to admit that they can't be the only ones who are special. But in God's eyes, everybody's special. Don't reject the reason for God's purpose. Don't reject the idea of who Jesus is. Don't get so caught up in your own stuff that you can't see what others are going through or what others might need, but ask God to continue to show you how to move and how to operate with different eyes, that there may have been some places in your life when you said, I don't care about anybody or anything, but what it is I'm going through. But sooner or later, you understood that God opened your eyes to realize that the world was bigger than you, that issues were larger than you, and you had an obligation to understand what it meant to walk with the Lord and so you need to ask God to walk with you daily you need to ask God to trust uh, you daily with the, whatever he lays on your heart you need to be obedient with the direction that God has given you some of y'all can declare there were some moments when I couldn't see it all I could see was what I needed but I thank God that God opened my eyes to new possibility new hope and new future understand this thing Paul says, in order to remember who you are, you're going to have to make some adjustments in your approach. The second thing is, Paul says, in order to remember who you are, Paul says people are going to try to replace what sound with what will bring them personal reward. They're going to try to replace what's been sound with what will bring them personal reward. I'm in the text. Paul is telling Timothy, don't stop what you're doing. Because the time's going to come when people won't even want to be bothered with it. They're going to choose not to believe it. They won't say it doesn't make sense. Uh, they won't say this is wrong. They won't say I can't see how this is going to work. It's not the content they're going to dispute. It's the commitment they're going to run away from. Because they will just turn it off. It's not that it ain't true, not that it ain't, don't work, not that it's not beneficial. They're just going to turn it off. Look what Paul says. He says, instead, what they will do to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from truth and turn aside to myths. Uh-oh. To suit their own desires, they're going to gather around teachers a great number so it's to say what their itching ears want to hear. Paul says they want their ears to be tickled. They want to be told things that make them feel good. So they will gather around them people who say what they want to hear and not what they need to hear. So because you don't want to face what the truth is, you literally, watch this, create your own truth. What happens is you construct a platform for cognitive dissonance and psychosis. You literally refuse to deal with reality. That's what psychosis is by definition. That a person's thoughts and emotions are so impaired that they conflict with reality. It isn't that you see things differently. It isn't that we got different opinions. That is, I literally think something else 
far-fetched and unrealistic. And so I believe this so I can live the way I want, not the way I'm called to. I'm in the text. They're going to gather around them teachers to say that their itching ears want to hear. But verse 4, they will turn their ears away from truth and turn aside to myths. Still ain't get it. Let me put it to you like this. I was watching uh, a CNN clip the other day. It was a CNN interview. And Reverend Robert Schneck, Reverend Robert Schneck, popular evangelical pastor and writer, was on an interview, and he said, he said, Trump's administration called some of the leading white evangelicals into a room and told them, made the deal, that if you give us the evangelical vote, we will swing the Supreme Court your way and make it conservative so your issues will be in the forefront of the country. And from that moment on, the evangelical movement made a deal with the devil. From that moment, the people who profess moral foundation started selling out to Trump and making excuses for his foolishness. Google it if you think I'm lying. So the administration got people to say what they wanted them to say and make the people feel good about being racist. They told them what they wanted to hear. So that's why you can have Paula White talk about God sent Trump and she's going to call African angels to declare victory. That's why you got Robert Jeffries uh, from First Baptist in Dallas who can say that Trump's uh, behavior of grabbing women by the genitalia is not that big of an issue. Or so Rod Parsley and Kenneth Hagan can talk about what God is saying through and with Trump and those who opposed him are opposing God. That the myth of white oppressive imperialistic theology has been sold for power. The myth that Paul is talking about is the myth that you are better than everybody else is, and everybody is subject to you. The myth is what James Baldwin says is the ability to ignore and abuse black life with a sense of exceptionalism and privilege with little if any guilt. The myth is that you tell yourself that you feel better about yourself while denying others the human dignity you would only expect for yourself. The myth means that you don't have to work with anybody. You just do what you want to do and let other people adjust. That's, what you, that's why you can believe that a loser can tell you that he won the election by a landslide because the myth told you that you were not supposed to lose. That's why some people can tolerate when 45 calls anything that doesn't agree with him fake news because the myth told you that you always supposed to be right. That's why there's some people who hated Obama so much because the myth told you that a black man isn't supposed to be telling you what to do as the leader of the free world. That's why you can hold on to the myth uh, that happened in Charlottesville and listen to the devil tell you that there were very fine people on both sides to make you feel better about your racism. That's why you can hold on to the myth that there was no collusion when he was working with the Ukraine and working against the government. That's why you can believe the myth when black drug addicts are criminals, but you believe white drug addicts are the victims of an opioid epidemic epidemic because black folk ain't supposed to have soul. That's why you can declare uh, that black man isn't supposed to have anything in this free world or you believe that Mexicans are taking your job and you that's why you need a wall because the myth tells you that things are supposed to be working out for you and nobody else. That's why you can believe that all Muslims are terrorists because the myth will have you believing that you're a victim and America has done 
done nothing to oppress the destroy Arab nations. That's why you can believe that black people are criminals and all they want to do is drugs and have babies and rob you in the alley because the myth told you that they are productive in the society and they just want to take what you have. That's why you can believe black folks are on welfare because the myth told you that they're lazy and don't want to work when the fact is the majority of people on public assistance are white folk. That's why you can be supportive of police and shout police lives matter and blue lives matter and be silent on the killing of murder of black police, of black people by police violence because the myth has told you that we're all deserving of what happens to us and we must have done something to deserve it. That's why you can storm the nation's capital and break windows and invade people's offices and put your feet up on desks because somebody told you that you could do whatever you wanted to. That's why people are confused when black folk are saying if it had been Black Lives Matter up on the Capitol, if it had been black people protesting on the Capitol, there'd have been blood on the steps and blood in the street because the myth has told you that you can do whatever you want to do and the law don't apply to you because you've let people tell you what you wanted to hear and they never told you the truth. You have chosen your leaders and voices to be people who don't bring together but who tear apart. You exploit but you don't educate. Who can condemn a rally and speak out against police violence? but then turn around and not mention a word when police are killed on the Capitol sit, uh, steps for the actions that you've committed. The leadership you have chosen can contribute, can, can contribute to division for four years with this president. But when the time comes to impeach him and have him removed, you want to talk about healing and moving on. Tell Mitch McConnell, I said, go fly a kite. He sat by the sidelines and let this terrorist pump ignorance into the minds of so many. And now he wants to act like he's tired of it. All of them need to be locked up. All of them need to be tried for treason and prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. McConnell, Josh Hawley, Ted Cruz, Giuliani, John Trump Jr., Mo Brooks, all of them because you told the people what they wanted to hear and not what they needed to hear. Paul says they stray away from the truth and they side with myths. Myths, that's Paul's word, myths. But there's a, truth, there's a thing about myths. You keep having to tell the myth over and over again to make it a reality. See, if you live in fantasy, you eventually get lost in the tragedy of your illusion. And your world will come crashing down on you eventually. You find people who will always see themselves in the perpetual state of delusion in breakdown or despair. And you will get an event like you did the other day. You get an event just like you get the other day. In fact, and I'm saying it, somebody owes Jeremiah Wright an apology. Because it sounds like chickens have come home to roost. Truth is, there will always be people who deny the truth. There will always be people who convince themselves that you are the problem. But don't fall for the myth. Don't fall for the illusion. Make sure that you understand that you rest on the side of truth. Trust God and to show you what truth you stand on. Because the truth of the matter is, if you stand on God's truth, there's a hope that moves past all of the myths of your life. That despite the places where other folk will tell you that you cannot, that's the myth. God says, I'm a God who can do all things but fail. That if you understand that you don't stand on the myth, but you stand on the promise. Stand on the promise and God will deliver you and send you to the places that's your purpose to go. God says, he says, Paul says that there's going to be some people who literally refuse uh, 
what this what is sound so they can get their own reward. But the final thing is that I'm done. Here it is. Paul says, remain. He said, because the folks who um, are going to remain as resilient as you can for the good work. Despite what other folk are doing, Paul says, remember who you are and remain resilient as you can for the good work. Paul wants Timothy to know it's going to be struggle, not for popularity, but for purpose of the mission. Everybody's not going to buy into the work. Everybody's not going to buy into the work. Some of them will have their own agendas. And let me pause parenthetically and just say that Paul is talking not only about the sense of the spiritual, but he's also talking about the realm of the practical. In other words, Paul is saying not only will there be people in the world who will turn their ears to the truth of the Spirit, but there will be people in the church who turn their ears away from the truth of the Spirit as well. <laughs> oh, you didn't think that all of these recalcitrant, reluctant, petulant, celebrating, ignorance, rigid individuals were only outside of the church, did you? No, 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 no. Paul says there will be people who will be belligerent because it gives them something to do. Uh, you see, it's some, for some it's not about being right. For some it's about being seen. Yeah. You see, for many people who don't understand spirit, things soon become about power rather than purpose. See, the issue with these Republicans is what has been for some years, and I'm not anti-Republican, don't get that twisted. I'm not anti-Republican, but the problem I have with some of these Republicans for some years is they're not interested in the journey of politics. Politics is the process of negotiating sides. They are interested in power having everything go their way. And when you are more focused on power than you are relationship, you will miss what it means to work for the purpose. That's why there are Congress people who can say, even when they were held hostage for six hours, there are people who can still say, I don't think we should impeach the president. I don't think it's that serious because it's more about power than it is actual purpose and what's good for the country. Church is the same way. A whole lot of folks aren't looking to serve because they want to accomplish a goal. They want to be important even if it means destroying everything around them in the process. That's why 45 is a problem, because he doesn't care about America. He cares about what he cares about. And if it all has to be destroyed in the process, then so be it. But Paul says, even in those places, even when those kinds of people and those kinds of motives show up, Paul says, here it is, remember who you are. Paul says right there in verse 5, but you... Keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge the duties of your ministry. Now, oftentimes when we see this text, it's often preached around installations and ordinations and things of that nature for clergy persons, but, and that's okay, but that's not all it has to be. Paul says, keep your head. In other words, just because other people are losing control doesn't mean you have to lose control too. Just because other folk are getting ugly don't mean that you have to get ugly. Don't mean that you can't correct. It just means you don't have to get ugly. Just because others are acting out of character doesn't mean that you have to act out of character. Here it is. Don't let anybody throw you off who you are and what you're supposed to be doing. The fastest way people can get you to lose it is to get out of your own plan. And that's exactly what the terrorists tried to do this week. Like I said before, terror has always been a tactic of people who cower in fear. From the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan, to the influence of the Black Codes, from the terror of Tulsa, Oklahoma massacre, to the killing of Tamar Rice, to the lynching of James Byrd, to the education uh, prison pipeline, has always been a way to shake people off of their game. Paul says, don't let people shake you off your game. Stay focused and remain steadfast. He says, do the work of an evangelist. And before you get nervous, an evangelist just don't mean preacher. An evangelist is a bringer of good news. 
In other words, keep doing good and encouraging others around you. You see folks who want to throw you off your game do so because they don't want you to complete your assignment. Paul says don't let others who want to stop your light kill it. Don't let, don't let other folk kill your light. Continue to share good news. Continue to tell people what Jesus can do despite what other people are doing. What Jesus can do and how Jesus can do it. Keep encouraging and let others see the God in you and see the God that is able. And he says, discharge all your duties of your ministry. This isn't your opposition's decision to work it out. That's a word for somebody. This ain't your enemy's decision to see how it goes. You have an assignment to work it out. This isn't your enemy's choice for how you succeed or if you fail. You have assignment to work this thing out for God's glory. You have a purpose that you didn't even realize. Don't forget who you are. You're still God's child. Follow through with your work and your ministry, even when it doesn't look good, even when it doesn't look like you're doing what you're supposed to do. You still operate in the context of being a blessing for God. Best way I can explain that is what happened last week. It happened last week and it happened so fast, and even I got caught victim of it. I got caught victim of it too. Everybody saw it. Everybody in our community saw it. And we got to shaking our heads and rubbing our chin. Brother standing in the hallway, police officer, standing in the hallway in front of a mob of terrorists. And he stood there and he kept setting back up. He kept hollering, back up, back up. Brother's name is Eugene Goodman. Eugene Goodman said, back up, back up, and, and he kept backing up. It looked like he was running. He found his baton, and he picked it up, and he ran up the steps. And everybody in America, especially black folks, said, man, come on. They said, man, you're embarrassing us running away, man. Stand tall. Do something. Throw a punch. Do something. Do something, Eugene. Do something, Eugene. We was messed up. You, we thought Eugene had punked out and ran away. We thought, from the looks of things, it looked like he was failing. Oh, but what we learned later is that the direction Eugene was running was away from the United States Senate. And that he was running away from the Senate and running to protect those who had not yet had protection. In fact, they said he kept them away for a good minute and a half, but gave them just enough time to get the safety that they needed. Some of y'all are missing my teaching. That it looked like he was failing. It looked like he wasn't doing his job. But the truth of the matter is, and even in the sense of failure, it looked like he was saving lives. Some of y'all still ain't getting it. Keep being faithful even when it seems like you're failing, even when it seems like you're not doing it, even when it appears like it's not working, you need to know that you're still being a blessing to somebody, okay? Put it to you like this. Somebody had to go up the cross on Golgotha's hill. Somebody had to carry the burden of the cross on their own. Somebody had to get whooped and beat all night long. Somebody had to get the crown put on their head, and it looked like like he was failing. On Friday, it looked like he was failing. On Saturday, it looked like he was failing. But early on a Sunday morning, oh, that was good news because he saved somebody's life. Everybody testify that you got a savior that knows how to make it look bad, but it works out for your good. That you got a God that says it looks bad, but but he's still working it for oh my good. It looks like I failed, but all things work together for the good of them who love the Lord. Can anybody say it's working for my good? It's working for my good. Don't worry. Remember who you are. Show them who It looked like, it looked like he was failing. It looked like he wasn't doing his job. <laughs> but it turns out he was busy saving lives. Oh, somebody in here, you ought to understand. It might look like a setback for you. I just stopped by to tell you, he's still saving lives. It looked like <laughs> it ain't working for you. 
I just want you to know he's still saving lives. Look like it ain't working out for your benefit. Somebody need to know he's still saving lives. In fact, I bet you got a testimony. I bet you got a witness in your spirit that there was some place in my life when I thought everything was falling apart, when I thought I couldn't handle it anymore, when I thought I was losing it all, when everybody talked about me and said I was losing and I couldn't recover. But it turns out that he's still. Hey. He's still saving lives. He's still saving lives. He's still saving lives. Yeah, it looked like it looked like a mess. It looked like a mess, but he's still saving lives. I don't know, it looked like a mess. I don't know what it's gonna happen, but it, he's still saving lives. Yeah, yeah, so listen, listen, listen. Show them who you are. Show them who you are. You ain't gotta back down for nobody. You ain't gotta run from nobody. Sometimes you gotta stand your own ground. Sometimes you gotta declare that God is still placing a hedge of protection around you. It look a mess. I know it looks a mess. <laughs> but it's still saving lives. God, we love you. We love you, God. We love you. 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 We're grateful. Grateful for what you're doing. Grateful, God, that even though we can't see it, even though it looks messy, even though it looks messed up, even though sometimes it's unclear, even though it seems like the enemy is winning sometimes, even though it looks like the enemy is winning sometimes, we still believe that you're saving lives. Still believe that you're working for our good. So God, thank you. Thank you for worship today. Thank you for reminding us, God, that you're still working things out. And even if we can't see it, even if we can't figure it out, <laughs> even if it looks worse, we're remembering who we are. So God, right now we pray. Maybe somebody under the sound of my voice who needs fellowship, relationship with the New Calvary Baptist Church, who's looking for relationship with the Lord our God. We extend this moment right here for you. God, we're praying. And as those people who want to be in relationship, they just rest their hand upon their heart. They say, God, I need you. God, I'm calling for your will. I'm calling for your power. I'm calling for you just to continue to touch that your grace has looked out for, for me. I've gone through this life trying to figure this thing out, but God, I'm I finally figured it out, and I know that it's your help, your will, your way that's going to continue to keep me. So bless me now that as you change my heart, I ask that you change the direction in my steps. And God, I give you praise. I give you glory. I give you honor. And it is in the wonderful, marvelous, majestic name of Jesus that the believers believe in you. And we say amen. And amen. In fact, we put our hands together. We celebrate you right now. And we cherish what God is doing in this moment. Listen, we look forward to sharing with you. We look forward to worshiping with you. So listen, this Wednesday, we are going to share in our Bible study this Wednesday. So come on and tune on at 7 o'clock. We got a lot to talk about <laughs> as we go forward this Wednesday Bible study. Monday, we will be on our prayer call line at 8 a.m. We look forward to bringing in the week with you, so make sure that you are faithful. Please make sure that you give the church a call and you reach out or you contact us in some way for the Ma'afa presentation. We need some folks to share in that. We look forward to sharing with you. So here it is. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be grateful unto you. May the Lord place his countenance upon you and bid you peace both now and forevermore. And the people of God who love God in all things together 
together. Say amen, amen, and amen. Listen, we love you, and we're grateful to worship with you. Tell somebody next time we look to share. Until then, be well. Take care of yourself and each other. Be good. Peace.